This is the video for uh, Utilitarianism, chapters one and two. Normally, I say watch these lectures before doing the reading. In this case, you don't really have to. You can watch this lecture after doing the reading. You might even find it helpful to watch it after rather than before. I think you can do it in either order, um, but I'm not gonna talk about stuff you need to know for the reading. I'm just gonna talk about uh, three sort of interesting things in the reading. One, which might be tough to pick up on your own, and two, uh, which you could pick up on your own, but I'll just point them out uh, for fun. So starting with number one, is mill a rule or act utilitarian? So uh, probably you look at that question and you say, what? <laughs> what, what are those? Uh, so let's take a look at what Mill says about uh, utilitarianism. The doctrine that the basis of morals is utility or the greatest happiness principle, or in other words, utilitarianism, holds that actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong in proportion as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. By happiness is meant pleasure in the absence of pain, by unhappiness is meant pain in the lack of pleasure. So morality, pretty straightforward. Uh, right, something's right if it promotes happiness, something's wrong if it doesn't promote happiness, if it promotes pain, or if it produces pain. Um, and then similarly, um, page eight. Uh, if the greatest happiness of all is, as the utilitarian opinion says it is, the end of human action is, whoop, that should be it. I found a typo. It must also be the standard of morality, which can there, so the greatest happiness principle can be the standard of morality, which can therefore be defined as, so this is the standard of morality for the utilitarianism. The rules and precepts for human conduct such that the observance of them would provide the best possible guarantee of an existence such as has been described for all mankind and so far as the nature of things allow for the whole sentient creation. So the standard of morality is the rules and precepts that basically promote pleasure and lack of pain for all of humanity and in fact all sentient things. Uh, good, so utilitarianism says, you know, pleasure and lack of pain for everybody. But if you read these sort of two statements more closely, there's actually two different ways that you could read them. So one way is that, look, an action is right in proportion as it tends to promote happiness and is wrong in proportion as it tends to produce the reverse of happiness. So if you put a lot of emphasis on tend, the word tend, a tendency, what it normally does, what it typically does, what it usually does, it has this tendency, it has this predisposition. Some actions have a tendency to promote happiness or a tendency to produce the reverse of happiness, to produce pain. They have this tendency, even if they don't always produce happiness or even if they don't always produce pain. So giving a doctor giving somebody medicine tends to promote happiness, that curing somebody of an illness tends to produce happiness but sometimes it doesn't. So maybe you get cured of an illness and then because you're healthy, you go rock climbing and then you slip and fall and die. So you're not happy anymore. So doctors treating people tends to be good, but it's not always good. And so if you say an action is right if in proportion as it tends to promote happiness, you would say, well, look, when the doctor cured you of your illness, the doctor did something that was morally right. It had bad consequences. It didn't lead to more utility in the end. But the utilitarian isn't trying to produce the best consequences, period, or trying to produce the most utility, period. They're telling you what's right and wrong is what tends to produce the best consequences or what tends to promote the most utility or the most happiness. So it's not going to work every time. It's going to slip up sometimes. But what, what usually works is what you should be doing. So right and wrong is about doing what will usually bring about the most happiness. Or similarly, this passage. So the standard of morality are the rules and precepts for human conduct such that the observance of them would provide the best possible guarantee of existence, blah, blah, blah. So rules and precepts, the observance of which would provide the guarantees of things. And you might think, oh, the standard of morality is whatever rules of conduct, the observance of which would promote happiness as best as possible. So he says the best possible guarantee. So 
What rule should the doctor follow when it comes to giving out medicine? Well, the rule that's best going to promote happiness is just cure everybody, basically. I mean, I don't know, maybe there's a better rule, but something like cure everybody. It's not going to be don't cure somebody who is going to go rock climbing and slip and fall and die tomorrow. Because how, you know, how is the doctor going to know that? Nobody can predict that you're going to slip and fall and die when you go rock climbing if you get the medicine. So you might think, look, the standard of morality is about coming up with the rules that are going to lead to the best consequences if people follow them. It's not about like doing the best possible thing in every particular instance, because how would we even know what that is? It's too complicated. That's not even what morality is about. Morality is about coming up with the rules that if everybody follows them, it's going to tend to promote happiness. Where the tend come from? Well, back up in the original quote. So, uh, you know, the greatest happiness principle is about right and wrong being what tends to promote happiness. So that view, which leans on sort of tendency and the rules and principles that we should follow to sort of do as well as we can, this is called rule utilitarianism or rule consequentialism. The thought is that morality is about coming up with a system of rules where if you follow the rules, that'll tend to produce the best outcomes. What do we contrast that with? Well, that can be contrasted with act utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism says that actions are right if they promote happiness and wrong to the extent or in proportion to uh, as they produce the reverse of happiness. So very straightforward. It's right to do something if it promotes happiness and wrong to the extent it's right to do something to the extent that it promotes happiness and wrong to do something to the extent that it promotes unhappiness. And if we go back down to this other passage, uh, look, what's the standard of morality? It's the rules and precepts which would guarantee, you know, happiness for everybody. And so what, what are the rules of morality? Well, do whatever is going to promote happiness for everybody. So the act utilitarian is somebody who says, we judge actions based on utility. You know, if they promote utility, the action is right. And if they don't promote utility, the action is wrong. So it's not about coming up with like a set of rules, which if we follow them, that'll tend to promote utility. It's about just promoting utility. You, that's what you should do. So you can kind of read Mill as either. So he's got all the stuff I leaned on to emphasize the rule thing. So he does talk about rules and precepts, and he does talk about, you know, tendencies, what tends to promote. But I mean, look, the tendency stuff, you might think like, he's just talking loosely here, like, you know, something in proportion as it tends to promote happiness. So that's just a very complicated John Stuart Mill way of saying something's right to the extent it promotes happiness. It's right if it promotes happiness. So you could read this in the rule kind of way, or you could read it in the act kind of way. And similarly down here, I mean, yes, he says rules and precepts, but here he's describing what is like the standard of morality? What, like, what should we say the rules of morality are? So of course it's going to be rules and precepts, and it's just going to be, well, look, the rules and precepts are the ones where if you follow them, it provides the best possible guarantee. So you're trying to do as well as possible. So just the rules tell you do the best that you can. So that's the act kind of way. And so, I don't know, is he a rule utilitarian or an act utilitarian? People argue about this. You can uh, read about it. It kind of doesn't matter for us. Like we can keep both possibilities in our head. If you want to decide one way or another, that's fine. Um, but it's just nice to know that there is this distinction in utilitarianism. You could be either kind of utilitarian. The rule utilitarians say, look, this is much more practical. Uh, it's uh, a much more sensible way of approaching morality. You don't have to have like perfect knowledge of the future or something like this. Uh, we just come up with the rules that best promote, tend to best promote utility and we follow those. The act utilitarian responds, well, what do you, look, the rules might be easier to follow, but what if I'm in a situation where breaking the rule would lead to more utility? Shouldn't I just break the rule? Like that would be better. Uh, I don't care about what rule tends to promote the most utility. I care about what's actually gonna promote the most utility. I'll follow the rule when it works, and when it doesn't work, I'll just discard the rule, so forget the rule. So there's arguments on both sides. So that's rule and act utilitarianism. And then finally, uh, just some two interesting points of divergence, first between Mill and Kant, second between Mill and Aristotle. So page 13, Mill says, uh, look, 
utilitarian moralists have gone beyond almost everyone in asserting that the motive has nothing to do with the morality of the action, though it has much to do with the worth of the agent. He who saves a fellow creature from drowning does what is morally right, whether his motive is duty or the hope of being paid for his trouble. He who betrays a friend who trusts him is guilty of a crime, even if his aim is to serve another friend to whom he is under greater obligations. So this is about as different from Kant as you can get. Remember, for Kant, the uh, motive has everything to do with the morality of the action. We judge the morality of the action based on the intention, or as Kant says, the maxim. Is an action good or bad? Well, that depends entirely on your maxim, entirely on your intention. So was saving the fellow creature from drowning good or bad? It depends entirely on what your motive was. If your motive was duty, then it was good. And uh, if it was being paid for your trouble, then it wasn't good. It wasn't like actively bad. It's not bad to save somebody for money, but it wasn't good. There's nothing morally good about doing something for money. It had good results, but that's not what we're interested in. So for Kant, the morality of the action depends entirely on the motive. Whereas for Mill, he says, look, the motive is interesting if we want to know the worth of the agent. So I don't know, you're like a better person if you do it from duty rather than money. But your action, the morality of your action itself, saving the person from drowning, that doesn't depend at all on why you did it. It depends on the consequences, on the fact that you, the person didn't drown, and that's a good thing. So the morality of the action depends entirely on what happens and not at all on the motive. Whereas for Kant, it depends entirely on the motive and not at all for what happens. So this is about as huge as a divergence as we can get in ethics. And so if you want to compare and contrast Mill and Kant and decide, well, who do I find more compelling? This is like a huge contrast between them. So which approach to morality uh, do you think is best? So that's Mill and Kant. And now we move to Mill and Aristotle where things are a little less obvious of a contrast. So Mill's got a bit to say about virtue in uh, chapter two, and one of the things he says is, uh, look, the Stoics, who we haven't read, but uh, whatever, indeed, with the paradoxical misuse of language, which was part of their system, and by which they tried to raise themselves to a level at which their only concern was with virtue, were fond of saying that he who has virtue has everything that it is the virtuous man and only the virtuous man who is rich and beautiful is a king. But the utilitarian doesn't make any such claim on behalf of the virtuous man. Utilitarians are well aware that there are other desirable possessions and qualities besides virtue and are perfectly willing to allow all of them their full worth. So, so far, so good with Aristotle. Remember, Aristotle doesn't think virtue is everything. Eudaimonia, living a blessed life, living a happy life, happiness, uh, stuff like this. It includes virtue. You must be virtuous to be eudaimon, but there's more to life. You know, you need wealth and you need luck and you can't be too ugly and stuff like this. So, so far, so good. There's more things desirable in life than just virtue. Mill and Aristotle agree on this. The utilitarians and Aristotle agree. The utilitarians are also aware that a right action doesn't necessarily indicate a virtuous character. And the actions that are blamable often come from personal qualities that pr deserve praise. Ooh, hold up. So first, a right action doesn't indicate a virtuous character. So for Aristotle, what is a right action? Well, it's something done from the motive of virtue, in accordance with virtue. It's done the right way for the right reasons. So for Aristotle, just by definition, a right action must indicate a virtuous character. The continent person can do something like the right action. They can sort of get the right result, but they can't do it in the right way, so it's not going to be a fully right action. So if I do something but I feel bad about it, if I'm not virtuous about it, I have like a half right action, but it's not fully right. And so for Aristotle, a fully right action does indicate a virtuous character. And according to the utilitarians, actions that are blamable often come from personal qualities that deserve praise. So this is a little tougher for Aristotle, but in general, Aristotle doesn't think the virtues are going to make you do bad things, blamable things. The virtues are going to make you do good things. Sort of basically, by definition, getting it right is part of the virtue. So the virtue is really wholly concerned with getting it right and feeling the right way about getting it right. So you're not going to do something blamable from a good 
personal quality, from a virtuous personal quality. That's not going to happen. Whereas because the utilitarian is only concerned with the outcome of the action, you can have a blamable action with a bad outcome that comes from a good quality. So imagine you're a very kind person and you give somebody money. The personal quality deserves praise. It's good that you're kind, but then they spend the money on uh, a bomb and they kill somebody. Like, whoa, bad. You shouldn't have given them the money. So the utilitarian would say, bad action, whereas for Aristotle, presumably if you were virtuous, you wouldn't have given it to the bomb person in the first place. Similarly, a right action doesn't indicate a virtuous character. A right action is just whatever produces good consequences. So if I set off a bomb, but miraculously nobody is killed and it's just an exciting fireworks show for people, then it makes people happy. That's a right action, but that might not be a virtuous character because I was trying to kill people. So it looks like here we sort of have divergences uh, between Mill and Aristotle. And then especially the utilitarian, so they, do hold that in the long run, the best proof of a good character is good actions. And they firmly refuse to consider any mental disposition as good if its predominant tendency is to produce bad conduct. So you might think, oh, okay, this is back to sounding like Aristotle. Look, what's the proof that you have a good character, good action? Aristotle basically says that. You can't be virtuous if you're not doing virtuous things. There's no such thing as virtue just sitting alone in your room. Virtue is a process. So the best proof of a good character is good actions. But look, if you think about it, what are the good actions for the consequentialist? It's not what Aristotle has in mind, really. It's just whatever promotes utility. So Mill here is saying that the best proof of a good character is doing a bunch of stuff that best promotes utility. And in fact, the consequentialist firmly refuses to consider any mental dispositions as good if its predominant tendency is to produce bad conduct. And what is bad conduct? Bad outcomes. And so, for the utilitarian, a good mental disposition is just something that tends to produce good outcomes, and a bad mental disposition is something that just tends to produce bad outcomes. And that might not line up with our typical no notions of good and bad dispositions. So, is kindness a good disposition? I mean, on the surface, yes, but does it tend to produce good outcomes or bad outcomes? I don't know. That's kind of not a philosophy question. That's a social scientific question. We have to go measure the outcomes of what kind people do and what unkind people do and see who produces the best outcomes. So it could be that being kind produces worse outcomes. Maybe if you leave people to fend for themselves, they just get stronger on their own and being kind just hurts them. So this, which I freely grant, makes utilitarians unpopular with many people. So it's kind of a weird view on the virtues. But this unpopularity they must share with everyone who takes seriously the distinction between right and wrong. And so the thought is, look, if you really care about right and wrong, good and bad, right and wrong is good consequences and bad consequences. So if you really care about good consequences and bad consequences, you should endorse the dispositions of character which lead to good consequences and the, object to the ones that lead to bad consequences, even if they're not the ones that you thought were the ones that matter. So um, how far is Mill from Aristotle? I don't know, it kind of depends in part on social scientific research into is the person who is virtuous in Aristotle's sense somebody who produces a lot of utility, or are they not? And I don't really know.